One of the biggest existential questions we continue to ask ourselves is, why are we here? No doubt part of the answer is philosophical, but part is also rooted in physics. The reason is that we are made of stuff. We are made of matter. And that matter is governed by physical laws. So when physicists try to figure out why the universe exists or why it looks the way it does, one of the basic things they have to account for is the building blocks of the universe, the matter that we can see. This might seem trivial, but is it really a given? Not in physics, because matter is not the simplest thing there could have been. The simplest thing in physics is nothing, the emptiness of space-time. In fact, even in our current universe, there's a lot more of nothing than there is of something. So why isn't the entire universe made of nothing? Funny you should ask, because according to physics, as we understand it, that's pretty much what the universe should be made of. Why? Because our theories and observations indicate that whenever matter is created, an equal amount of antimatter is also created. But when matter and antimatter meet, they annihilate each other in a tremendous burst of energy. So the Big Bang should have created an equal amount of both matter and antimatter, resulting in a burst of energy and leaving behind pretty much nothing. Now, nothing in physics is not exactly nothing as you probably understand it, as you'll see later. And while a universe made of nothing would probably make for a simpler theory, it is not a theory for our universe, because our universe is clearly not nothing. It is something. But then the question is, why is nearly everything we can see from the smallest dust particle to stars many times bigger than the sun all made of matter? Where did all the antimatter go? This is one of the biggest puzzles in physics. In order to find a clue, we have to turn to our old friend, quantum mechanics. So buckle up, the hunt for the origin of matter is coming up right now. This video was partly inspired by a documentary I watched on Magellan TV, today's sponsor, called Black Holes and the High Energy Universe. This video looks at how energy emission of X-rays and gamma rays captured by some of our most recent satellites reveals clues about how the universe came to be and why it looks the way that it does. It's a new kind of streaming documentary service founded by the filmmakers themselves. Featured subjects include history, nature, science, and technology. You can watch it on any of your devices as well as your TV anytime without any ads. Magellan has a new offer right now for Arvin Astriers. You can get 30% off an annual membership. That's an entire year for less than $3.50 a month, and this is valid for prior subscribers too. I highly recommend Magellan TV be sure to click the link in the description. The best theory of the stuff of the universe, the matter it contains, is the standard model of particle physics. This theory not only describes matter, but also how this matter interacts with each other in terms of three of the four fundamental forces, electromagnetic, weak, and strong forces. We also have another theory, Einstein's theory of general relativity, which describes how matter interacts on large scales via the curvature of space-time, or gravity, which is the fourth fundamental force. Pretty much everything we know about how the universe works is described by these two theories. There is a small issue here because neither the standard model nor general relativity seem to account for how we got so much matter and hardly any antimatter. The first thing we have to address is the problem of how something can come from nothing. I think this is considered a problem because this question was formulated in a time before quantum mechanics. But with quantum mechanics, now in our tool chest, this quote-unquote problem has a workable solution. If you have a box and you take out all the objects, particles, and radiation in that box, you might say that this box contains nothing. But in quantum physics, that box does not really have nothing. The laws of quantum mechanics will still be valid inside that box. This means it will still have quantum fluctuations. This is the idea that particles can be created and destroyed over very short periods of time, such that the universe doesn't really notice. What I mean is that these are virtual particles that can't be directly measured, but we know they're there because we can detect their overall effect. Empty space has energy. It can exert a force, as can be seen in the Casimir effect. This effect is caused by the pressure difference between the inside and outside of a set of smooth plates due to the differences in quantum fluctuations inside versus outside. 
So when we think of the vacuum of space as nothing, we have to remember that it is really something. And this something is due to the laws of quantum mechanics, specifically the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says that energy can be created in the vacuum of space as long as it is returned very quickly, such that it obeys this equation, where h is Planck's constant. In other words, the startling implication of this equation is that it says it is okay to temporarily cheat energy conservation as long as you do it very quickly, such that the energy is conserved over this short period of time. So overall energy is conserved because any energy created in the vacuum is returned. These are quantum fluctuations of virtual particles that I'm talking about. A computer simulation of this phenomenon looks like this. These particles are coming into and out of existence all the time, everywhere in the universe even inside of our bodies. But when you create matter from the vacuum, it also creates an equal amount of antimatter. In any experiment where we've created matter, we've also created an equal amount of antimatter. Antimatter is just like matter, except with the opposite charge. So for example, the antimatter equivalent of the electron would be a positron, which is just like the electron, except with a positive charge instead of a negative charge. Similarly, there are antineutrinos and antiquarks. When matter and antimatter collide, they annihilate each other, creating tremendous energy. A simple Feynman diagram looks like this, where energy in the form of photons can create an electron-positron pair. This diagram can be reversed such that you can have an electron and positron coming together to annihilate each other, forming photons. Energy is conserved because the mass of the electron and positron is converted to energy using the formula E equals mc squared. Now here is the mind-blowing thought. As long as energy is conserved, then in principle, you can create vast amounts of matter from the vacuum of space. But presuming the laws of physics are the same today as they were at the beginning of the universe, you would expect to see just as much antimatter as we do matter. The problem is, however, that nearly all the stuff of the universe that we can observe appears to be matter. Antimatter appears to make up an extremely small fraction compared to the matter that's present in the universe. So we need to figure out what set of circumstances could have resulted in this matter-antimatter asymmetry we observe in the universe. This issue is called the problem of baryogenesis, which is the physical process in the early universe which caused the imbalance between matter and antimatter. 13.8 billion years ago, when the universe was born, it was thought to have been matter-antimatter symmetric, meaning equal amounts of both. But within the first second of its existence, nearly all the antimatter in the universe annihilated. So something happened that either preferentially created matter or preferentially destroyed antimatter. What could have caused this? In 1967, Russian nuclear physicist Andrei Sakharov proposed that the universe must satisfy three conditions in order to create matter and antimatter at different rates. These conditions are the following. The universe must be out of equilibrium. The universe must exhibit C and CP violation. The universe must have baryon number violating interactions. Basically, Sakharov proved mathematically that the universe can start with an equal amount of each and end up with more matter than antimatter if these conditions are met. So let's look at what these conditions mean. The first condition is easy to meet because we live in a universe that's cooling and expanding. It is not in equilibrium. Equilibrium only occurs when a system like a room has had enough time for all the different components in different locations to mix and interact with each other, such that energy is no longer being transferred from one part to another. In other words, all parts of the room have had time to communicate with each other. This has not happened for the universe. C symmetry stands for charge conjugation symmetry. It just means that the laws of physics should apply just as equally to antimatter as they do to matter. If you have a particle spinning clockwise, the antiparticle should also be spinning clockwise. If you have a particle decay in a certain way, the antiparticle should also decay in the same way. But if C symmetry is violated, particle and antiparticles can behave opposite to one another. It turns out that the weak force breaks C symmetry all the time. This is because neutrinos only have one type of spin. 
If you take a neutrino that is spinning clockwise and try to apply the C transformation to make it an anti-neutrino, it doesn't work. This is because neutrinos always spin clockwise and anti-neutrinos always spin counterclockwise. In order to change the neutrino to an anti-neutrino, you must also change its direction. This requires what's called a CP transformation. CP symmetry is the combination of C symmetry and P symmetry. P stands for parity. This means mirror image. So when you look in the mirror, your reflection's left hand is your right hand, for example, and vice versa. Parity in the context of particles can represent spin. So a particle with a clockwise spin would rotate counterclockwise, for example. CP symmetry is a fancy way of saying if you have some equation governing a particle's interaction and you replace all the particles from the equation with their respective antiparticles representing C symmetry, and then you also reverse the spatial coordinates, that is, replace them with a mirror image of the antiparticles representing P symmetry, the result of the equation should be exactly the same. In particle physics, if you have a particle spinning clockwise and decaying upwards, its antiparticle should spin counterclockwise and decay upwards 100% of the time, if CP is conserved. If not, then CP is violated. The weak force has processes that violate CP transformation, and thus CP symmetry can also be broken by the standard model. For example, K, B, and D mesons, which are particles made up of one quark and one antiquark, can violate CP symmetry when they decay. But the problem is that there is not enough CP violating interactions to explain the difference in the amount of matter and antimatter volume we see in the universe. And these symmetry violations are not short by just a few percentage points, but by many orders of magnitude. So they cannot by themselves account for the abundance of matter. The last point about baryon conservation is also a problem. A baryon is a particle composed of three quarks. For example, a proton is a baryon made of two up quarks and one down quark. A neutron is also a baryon made up of two down quarks and one up quark. In general, you cannot destroy baryons. You can only change them. For example, in beta decays, a neutron can turn into a proton and vice versa. You start with a baryon and end up with a baryon. This is baryon number conservation. In order to satisfy the third Sakharov condition, we would need a process such that, for example, it can make two baryons from one baryon, that is, one proton turning into two protons. In nature, we've never observed this happening. So the first condition is met. The second condition is met somewhat, but the third condition is not met from what we observe. So the question remains, what caused the matter-antimatter asymmetry? There are some speculative theories, some more crazy than others. One of the most intriguing ideas is taken from something that Richard Feynman pointed out. He said that antimatter is mathematically equivalent to ordinary matter moving backwards in time. So some cosmologists have proposed that perhaps at the Big Bang, antimatter started going backwards in time and never encountered matter. The idea is if you rewound the cosmic clock to the time of the Big Bang and kept rewinding beyond that, what would you see? Perhaps the universe banged in two opposing temporal directions. In our universe, the arrow of time favored matter, and in the other, the opposite arrow of time favored antimatter. Of course, the big problem with this hypothesis is that Whenever we create antimatter in the lab, they all seem to be going forwards in time, not backward. So this probably is not a real thing, but it's a fascinating possibility, even if it's fiction. Another idea is that perhaps matter and antimatter separated too quickly to have annihilated each other, and that there might be mirror antimatter galaxies in solar systems in distant parts of the universe. But if this was the case, we would expect to see some huge fireworks in the form of high-energy gamma rays from the border areas where matter objects encountered antimatter objects. No such high-energy signatures are being observed. One of the promising ways that scientists are hoping to find what happened very close to the Big Bang is by studying gravitational waves. Theoretically, just like we have a cosmic microwave background that tells us a lot about what occurred close to the Big Bang by its electromagnetic signature, there should also be a cosmic gravitational wave background. This will likely reveal even more information about the physics that occurred close to the Big Bang. 
Our instruments are not sensitive enough right now to pick up this gravitational background yet, but physicists are hopeful that future more advanced detectors will reveal this one of the most well-kept secrets in the universe. And if you enjoy my videos, consider joining my Patreon community. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.